really have um, and that is um, those of you all who are carrying maps um, can make use of those um, we also have a chance to, uh, to look a little bit at the terrain and landscape um, before being introduced to it um, when leaden and iron missiles are flying through the air um, uh, at us um, and so I'm going to take advantage of at least that potential um, opportunity during the course of, um, of the program um, today. And so one of the things I want you to do is to take some mental snapshots, if not real ones, um, of the area where we are right now. You're along the critical, vital Lafayette Road, the main route for the Union Army back towards the, uh, the city of Chattanooga. Chattanooga is about 10 miles to our north, up the Lafayette Road, through Rossville Gap and Missionary Ridge for the Union Army as they are now essentially consolidated all the elements back together again. Um, this is the main route that they should be expecting to use to get uh, positioned back closer to Chattanooga if need be. Now, you are also on right now the farm of John McDonald. He owned 160 acres of land here and unlike most farmers in this area, his principal crop was not corn, it was wheat. Um, and he had cleared much of his 160 acres. While there is some refinement yet to do to the landscape here on the McDonald farm, in general, the openness of this area that you are seeing right now is what was here at the time of the battle. And the the uh, farmstead itself stood on this um, rise, the house down closer to the road. There was a large uh, um, hill, uh, or excuse me, orchard on the top of the hill where the visitor center is um, located. A um, series of fences around um, uh, most of the fields and dividing the fields into uh, to smaller areas. But the critical thing right now is to remember this much more open ground here in the area of the visitor center. We'll factor that into our story a little bit later on. Additionally, at the time of the Civil War, and this is where the landscape starts to, uh, to vary, at the time of the Civil War, there was more open ground off to the um, southwest of us. In fact, while you would not have been able to see the structures of the Snodgrass farmstead probably, you would have been able to see a corridor of open fields that stretched off in that direction um, and connect it with the Snodgrass field um, there at the other uh, Snodgrass farmstead. And the Mullis farm, farm and its large open fields stretched off to the west from down in that corner of the field. Um, that will, um, will play an important role um, and you have that, um, that window looking towards that rise of ground on which the Snodgrass family, family farmed um, and, um, and lived. So remember this because we'll bring it into our discussion a little bit later on. So, um, we're going to go down this slope, down a path, um, so be careful of your footing on the wet grass. important um, landscape element that um, I want to, uh, to point out to you um, is this very road that we are standing on and most of you all are looking westward um, along a road that is today um, too greatly um, overlooked because you are presently standing on the 1863 alignment of the McFarland Gap Road. 
Today, most of you all know that what is called McFarland Gap Road is the uh, westward arm of the, uh, the intersection there at the, uh, the traffic light. Um, Reeds Bridge Road going out to the east, McFarland Gap Road going out to the west. But at the time of the Civil War, only a farm lane ran westward from up where the traffic light is today, from up at the intersection of the Lafayette Road and the Reeds Bridge Road. The main road to McFarland Gap was this alignment right here. It left the Lafayette Road at this point. There was a tenant farmer's um, residence at, at the intersection. The road ran uh, westward into the woods, and then in the woods about one half mile, arced a little bit northwestward in the area of the Mullis Farm, and then joined what is today the modern alignment out about a mile to the west of where we are right now. Why is this important? If the Lafayette Road is cut to the north of here, uh, what would be another possible route of the Union Army's escape from the battlefield? Through McFarland Gap in Missionary Ridge instead of Rossville Gap. And so that morning, um, this road is going to start factoring into um, the consideration of the Union line as well. Um, today, you can follow part of this historic alignment into the woods about half a mile, but then the alignment is abandoned and today privet choked um, so that even in the winter time, it is basically impossible to follow that alignment. Um, but some of you all who are from the area um, will know that out on the Farland Gap Road on the battlefield side, there are two um, par small parking areas with gates. Um, the um, McFarland Gap Road joined the present alignment at the second or western gate. Um, joined, came in um, out of the privet uh, from, the, uh, from the southeast. So, all right, well, we're going to walk on further. you all looking to your left and right as we walk the, uh, the next little bit. This is not, um, I'll hang on just a second, like this. This is not as evident um, as if we were uh, simply walking down through the woods. But we have left the Lafayette Road um, there, which in general runs along the crest of um, yet another one of the little stair-step rises um, that comes out of the um, West Chickamauga Creek Valley and stair steps up higher um, as you go further to the west. Um, just a little bit further to the west, those stair steps become even more prominent because you get into the main body of Missionary Ridge. Um, but just to the east of the Lafayette Road is another north, generally north-south low rise of ground. Some of you all know, some of you all who were with us last um, evening know um, that uh, George Thomas um, on the afternoon of the 19th had begun to identify and communicate that a new line would be developed on the crest of a low rise near the Lafayette Road. We are walking up onto the crest of that low rise now. Um, and so as we do, I'd like for you to look to your left and right in the woods and also, you can look ahead, although the way the road is not banked up, it's not uh, uh, quite as evident. But we are walking upslope on the crest of that, uh, to the crest of that um, low rise. Um, and so kind of notice how low it is right, um, right down there, and then watch the ground rise up um, as we uh, progress further.
on the, uh, for this program at the visitor center. Yeah. Uh, oh, for, oh, well, um, when they were in camp, um, they were supposed to designate an area and dig um, a sink and retrieve, uh, and soldiers were supposed to um, take care of their bodily functions at, um, at that. Um, but getting um, large groups of mostly young men to do anything um, <laughs> is, uh, is one of the greatest challenges of, um, uh, of a military force. Um, and so there were regular violations of the camp police regulations. Um, and so the NCOs and the officers were always looking out for um, a soldier um, who was um, uh, relieving himself um, uh, rather than taking the time to go to the uh, to the sink or the retreat. Um, and, and this, particularly in a day when they don't understand uh, germs and disease, um, this becomes a real problem um, in camps when they're in a, one place for a longer time period and it only fosters more disease. Now while they don't understand germs and disease, they do generally understand that a clean, the cleaner a person is, the cleaner the place where the person lives, the less likely that person is to get sick. Um, and so that's why they don't want the men simply um, uh, standing by the nearest tree uh, where they're bivouacking. Um, they want to have that designated area. Um, and in general, <coughs> Confederate camps are far dirtier, nastier than Union camps. Um, and that all, that's reflected in the disease rate in, in uh, Confederate units. Um, at different times of the war at different places. Now, on a battlefield like this, um, you know, the, the, that's not necessarily a consideration. Uh, so, uh, but, yeah, they, in, particularly in camp, they try to have designated areas. They also knew in general that you want to have, if you're camped along a body of water, you want to have your sink or latrine downstream. Um, <laughs> and, and, um, the, um, and your camp, particularly where you get water, upstream. Except if you're a unit camp downstream of another unit. <laughs> um, as you all stand along um, Battle Line Road, and particularly if I can encourage you to look south along Battle Line Road, um, particularly there to the south of you, you are looking south along the crest of that low rise of ground. Right here where we stand right now, the true crest is just in the woods right there. Um, but that's because of uh, this little um, bump in the, uh, the terrain, kind of a little flat knoll um, on the low rise right here. And as the Union line develops, um, they are going to actually have to push the line out just a little bit in front of the crest to be able to cover the low ground there. But in general, the, you are now looking south along the crest of that um, low rise of ground. As you look through the trees, to your uh, front or to the west and southwest, you can see through an area of forest where through mechanical and chemical means, we have reduced the, uh, the vegetation uh, to make it more like it was at the time of the battle. Um, as you look through the, uh, the trees, you're looking down slope into the Kelly Field, um, and then across the Kelly Field, you can see traffic moving north and south on the other uh, LaFayette Road. This is that low rise of ground that Thomas had identified. Um, there's the Granite Division having arrived in the Kelly Field on the morning of the, the 19th and then advancing out to the, um, to the east. Um, Thomas uh, made his headquarters, if you wanted to say he had to have a place, um, essentially the Kelly Field and repeatedly during the course of the 19th as first Brannon, then Baird, then Johnson, then Palmer um, become engaged out to the east. Thomas rides back and forth between the Lafayette Road at the Kelly Field and the area of the fighting. As he did that, he observed this low rise of ground just in the woods to the uh, east of the Kelly Field and running basically north and south and parallel with the Lafayette Road. And it was by afternoon that Thomas begins to um, think of this low rise of ground as the piece of terrain on which to anchor or build or at least designate a new line. As a result of the fighting out to the east, the uh, divisions out there um, had become rather attenuated. And by afternoon, you really only have 
on Johnson's division out there, Baird with two brigades going out to support Johnson, and Palmer in the last part of his fight with Cheatham and Stewart is so shattered that it is going to be unlikely that he can stay out there. And so Thomas um, rides out to tell Baird and Johnson that at dark they are to pull back to this low rise of ground. Because there is a lull at that time, he brings Baird and Johnson back here and shows them this low rise of ground so that they have some idea before darkness sets in as to where they are supposed to, um, to locate. The, um, um, even before um, dark, even before the, um, the Confederates attack one last time just before dark, Union units that are going to build this line begin to arrive. By late afternoon, with the repulse of um, Stewart and the last of Cheatham, Palmer's generally shattered division is ordered out of uh, the woods uh, in the area of the south end of the, of the Po field uh, and other points nearby. And Palmer is ordered to bring his three brigades, Hayes and Cruft and Gross, back to the Kelly field and reconstitute them. Reorganize a little bit, rest, <laughs> resupply with ammunition, and await the next message. And so as darkness begins to settle on the battlefield, Johnson's or Palmer's division marches up from the south and into the Kelly field. Many of the men, having now fought all day and having had, or at least all afternoon, having had little opportunity to eat something, um, it's starting to get cool. Little fires will be um, uh, kindled in the clusters of the regiments of those three brigades. At that time, they are not taking up any position. They are simply gathering, reorganizing, uh, resupplying with, uh, with ammunition. Just as darkness begins to settle, uh, particularly in the woods, some of the troops of Johnson's division actually begin to make the preparations to move back to this line. But just at that moment, Claiborne's division is going to attack out to the uh, east of us and it is going to delay the relocation of Johnson and um, um, uh, Baird's troops um, out of uh, their relo um, delay their relocation back to, um, to this position. But it is that attack which also brings the first significant unit onto this very line. As the fight erupted with Johnson and Baird against Claiborne, uh, there is concern that since no, either, neither of their flanks are anchored, that the Confederates might find those flanks um, and rout Johnson and Baird. They may need support. John Palmer's men, who have now had a couple hours at most to rest and refit, reorganize um, in the field here, receive the order. And the assembly is sounded, um, and Cruft and Hazen's brigades march out of the Kelly Field along a farm lane that followed the southern end of the Kelly Field and into the woods. It is now dark, certainly in the woods. As they enter the woods along the farm lane, they sense that the ground begins to rise. As they continue further, the farm lane begins to bend around to their left, to the north, and Cross Brigade in the lead going down the farm lane, goes up the rise, on the crest of the rise, that bend to the north is um, complete, and Cruft's brigade begins to move north along the, uh, the crest of the rise. Um, and recognizing in the dark that this might be a good place to form, Cruft's brigade, followed by Hazen, then begin to deploy to potentially move out to, um, to the east. They actually will advance a little ways to the east, um, encounter what they say is a, law, a, a union line. It probably is just some um, uh, rear elements, probably a couple of batteries, some clusters of ordnance wagons or the like um, in the woods marked by um, uh, uh, some fires, probably um, on another one of the little low rises or in some low ground. Um, but before they get too far to the east, the fighting out around Winfrey Field and Brock Field dies down and they will return to the crest of the low rise. <clears throat> the, um, uh, and so those two brigades, Cruft and Hazen's brigade, 
are the first to actually wind up taking position on this, um, this low rise as part of Thomas's um, new line that he um, envisions. Over the next um, couple of hours, the elements of Baird and Johnson's divisions, um, having disengaged themselves from Claiborne, will pull back um, and they will begin to arrive here as well. Some of them going on out into the, uh, the Kelly field. <clears throat> there, um, they will, um, will try, uh, they'll try to reorganize um, and also try to get some, um, some rest for the uh, for uh, that uh, evening, it gives them a chance to um, to also resupply uh, with ammunition, um, and um, uh, it also uh, begins gives them a chance to start thinking about what had happened to them during the course of the day. One of Baird's brigade commanders is Benjamin Scribner, and Scribner writes later an account of. Um, his thoughts um, and experience that evening. Toward evening, my command, this was when he first went out to, uh, to support um, Johnson, um, but I picked the story up there because it shows the state of the confusion and the darkness. Toward evening, my command joined Johnson and Reynolds, um, and we had another battle on the same field we had fought over in the morning. The artillery was prominent in this engagement, and it was after 10 o'clock that night before all was quiet. Anxious to give my men some rest, General Baird was sought for orders. Having notified the officer on the right of my intention, an orderly was left to mark the spot and to communicate with me should necessity arise. I had not proceeded far until General Baird was met searching for me, so I retraced my steps with him to my command, not finding it where I had expected. Um, someone else in the meantime has ordered Scribner's Brigade um, to, uh, to move further back. The general became apprehensive that we were lost in the woods and might wander into the enemy's line. I began myself to feel uneasy and called out, orderly, sir, was the prompt response of the good soldier from the spot where he had been placed, but he was, not, but he was alone. He informed me that the brigade had moved back. The officer on the right feared a flank movement of the enemy the left of our line had been fired on, but you told me to stay here, and I stayed. <laughs> <laughs> General Baird conducted us to a large open field, the Kelly Field. My men laid down their weary bodies to rest. Our movements in the night had so confused me that I did not know even the points of the compass. Lieutenant Duvall was the only staff officer with me, the others and the orderlies having lost me in the darkness. So I directed the lieutenant to find out our whereabouts, whether that house off yonder was Kelly's where we had halted in the morning before the battle began. He was urged to learn all he could about the events of the day and to take two canteens along and fill them with water. I tried to impress him with my locality in order that he might find me when he returned. So I sat down upon the ground, holding the bridle of my horse in my hand to await news and water. But I waited and waited, but did not see him again until morning. He too had lost me. My condition was indeed forlorn and miserable. A cup of coffee that morning was the only nourishment since the evening before at Stevens Gap. My inflamed eyes itched and burned, asthmatic coughing and breathing, and all the discomforts of hay fever added to my sorry plight. At length, pity for my poor horse who had fared no better, diverted my mind from my own privations to his. A rail fence was found to which he was hitched, but in removing the saddle of my pistols, or sa my saddle, my pistols fell from the holsters, and with all my groping about, I was unable to find them. Observing a light in the woods at some distance off, I called out and found that it was the bivouac of Simonson's battery. They knew me at Perryville, and a party of them hasted, hastened to my assistance. They found my pistols, made my fire, spread my blanket before it, and would have shared their supper with me had I permitted them to rob themselves. I was soon alone again. It would not do to fall asleep, even had I felt like doing so, for I was anxious about the coming of my staff officer. More than 23 years have passed away since that distressing night. 
Other horrors have since filled my mind, but the long pain, painful vigil of that night of gloomy forebodings is yet fresh in my memory. As I crouched brooding over my lonely fire, the incidents of the day passed in review before me, renewing each sad scene. I was surprised and shocked again and again at the bleeding bodies of much-loved comrades. I mourned again over the prostrate form of Lieutenant Colonel Maxwell of the Second Ohio, whom I had assisted to an ambulance uh, after the battle of the morning. He was shot through the lungs, the bullet entering his breast and making its exit at his back. He wore a light buff vest, which was soaked with his blood, which made him a ghastly spectacle, spectacle to look upon. His own father could not have embraced and wept over him more fondly than did I. He was not dead, and ignoring my cause of grief, tried to console me for the reverses of the day and encouraged me with hope and ultimate victory, as if my disasters caused my emotion. He was a favorite officer, and I was sincerely attached to him. Imagine the thoughts that went through the minds of all of those that, um, that night. Um, the next morning at, um, at dawn, um, the, uh, the uh, improvement or the, uh, the further work on this, um, this line will begin. Now, of course, the Confederates uh, were expected to attack at day dawn, um, but they do not. Um, those of you all who went with Anton a little while ago um, have learned part of um, that story about why um, they do not, but particularly with that um, coming of, um, of dawn um, and daylight, the Federals really have an opportunity to refine this line that will define their left for September the 20th. Down in Palmer sector to our south, Gross's brigade which um, had been left in the field the evening before, is brought up and put on the other line to <coughs> Hazen's right. So all three uh, Palmer's brigades are on line. But soon, as the men began to construct field fortifications, which William B. Hazen says that Lieutenant Colonel Isaac Subin of the 9th Indiana um, was the man who um, initiated um, that effort, Come, uh, Suman coming to Hazen, saying that um, since there is time, since there is material in the forest, that the men should be encouraged to build some crude field fortifications. Ideally, breastworks would have been um, desirable, um, and in fact, um, the, um, the, the many soldiers will call what is constructed eventually breastworks. But with very few tools, very few sets of shovels, picks, and axes, they're not able to do much more than create piles of limbs, logs, branches, rocks, sticks, stones, stumps, Mr. Kelly's fence rails, and other soldiers' knapsacks that are generally knee to waist high, providing protection to soldiers who are laying, crouching, kneeling on the ground. And the real ringing of axes, the axes that are available mostly um, in the artillery batteries, because on the limber of each artillery piece was strapped an axe. And so for the batteries that still had their six guns and six caissons, there were 12 axes in that battery. Um, and, and in several instances, when after the battery had made use of the axes for a time, they were loaned to the adjacent infantry units in their um, brigade. Those axes are put to work. Um, and it is really or, um, just about dawn um, when the Confederates start hearing the true ringing of the axes through the woods indicating that the Federals are, um, are fortified, but the works begin to be constructed. As that occurs, they also begin adjusting the line. This pulling back to this position will also allow the Union divisions and brigades to take up their standard formation, where um, ideally a division would deploy two brigades up and one brigade back. And within a brigade, there would be two lines of troops, half the regiments in the front line, half the regiments in a second line. In Palmer's division, Gross's brigade, which had just come up on uh, the right of the division, on Hazen's right, Gross is ordered to, um, to pull back down off of the crest and go into reserve for the division. And he moved his four regiments and his battery back out into the Kelly Field. Here in Johnson's division sector, just to our, um, our south, 
The uh, three brigades of that division are initially organized that morning, one brigade behind the other. Each brigade in two lines, so for a time, Johnson's division actually is six lines deep. Just a narrow front with Philemon Baldwin's brigade, now under um, uh, William Berry of the 5th Kentucky. Um, that, in the, uh, that brigade in the first line, August Villick's brigade in the second line, in two lines, and then Dodge's brigade um, in the, the third brigade line, uh, it itself in two lines. Um, the, um, and now we enter the sector of Absalom Baird's division. And it is really Baird's division that is the most critical for, uh, for George Thomas's new line on this morning of September the 20th. We are right now in the sector of Starkweather's um, brigade. Four regiments shattered on the uh, morning of the, of the 19th in the fighting to the north of the Winfrey Field. Some of you all, I'm sure, were on the programs yesterday where Anton and Lee walked you out to the area where um, Starkweather and his men had suffered such, um, such grief. But now Starkweather has reorganized his brigade and brings it up on, um, on line and deploys it with two regiments in the front and two regiments in a second line on the back slope of this low rise of ground. Now today, as you explore the Battle Line Road area that follows along um, this, um, this developing Union line, um, you might um, say, well, Ogden, where are the multiple lines that you are describing? Um, well, um, the, during the course of the day, these multiple lines, two, three, four lines of troops, allowed unit commanders to shift units into the front line at different times. So 30 years later, when the National Military Park is created and the monuments are erected, where did the veterans of every unit want their monument to be? <laughs> what might someone think about their courage if their monument was in a second, third, fourth, fifth, or sixth line? Uh, and so generally the monuments are all on, um, on one line. Um, but you, um, uh, as we look south, the monument to the 21st Wisconsin, uh, the 24th of Illinois, 79th uh, Pennsylvania, and the 1st Wisconsin up here are the four regiments of Starkweather's Brigade, um, and they are deployed to, uh, to back during the course of the day. They will rotate units into, um, into the front lines. So. Uh, now, the other critical thing is, imagine this line developing to our south. We're right now on the right of uh, Baird's division. We look across the at least initially narrow front of Johnson's division. Beyond is Palmer's division. And then, as this line developed, um, Thomas ordering troops further to the south to close to the left part of uh, Reynolds' division. Turchin, for at some point, they have to bend or uh, 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 end the line, bend it back, refuse it, fold the line back. And that's the most critical thing and what we want to now look at. So we're going to start walking this way. <laughs> Casualties have been great, as great as 50%. Uh, for others, it is 33 or 25%. Uh, percent. Uh, but even for units that have taken relatively few casualties, they have lost men in other ways, too. Some soldiers um, have indeed skulked to the rear um, to get out of the hell of combat. Um, other men have legitimately taken a wounded soldier to the rear for care. And maybe even if that was the, your best soldier, how easy would it, for, would it be for him to become um, lost um, and disassociated with the unit in the limited visibility, smoky, forested um, environment. Um, and so these units have gotten smaller beyond just the casualties and killed and wounded. And some soldiers have simply dropped out from, uh, from exhaustion. So a regiment that started out the battle, I'm just going to make the number easier right now for me since I'm a terrible mathematician. Um, the um, a regiment that started out at 400 men maybe suffered 25% casualties, had 100 men killed and wounded. Um, they might only be 
um, 250 or even 200 strong by the morning of the 20th because of all these other men who have become disassociated in one form or fashion. Uh, you re you'll read the official reports and lots and lots and lots of the officers will say, and none of my men straggled. <laughs> then you start reading the soldiers' letters and diaries, the accounts of the units on either side. Of course, the accounts of the units on, the, uh, on either side say, every guy in the unit beside me straggled. Um, but um, you know, the, the, uh, the reality of human experience in combat is that some soldiers are just not going to stick to it. And one of the biggest challenges is to, uh, to keep men um, in line, in position, doing their jobs. So some of these units are getting um, relatively small. Um, and we are now walking along the crest of the low rise, and notice what starts to happen right here. The line begins to bend or fold back. In fact, the low rise stretches on off to the north. And look what is right here at this bend or angle in the line. The remaining guns of the 4th Indiana Battery. Um, they had, um, had been shocked in the fighting um, north of Winfrey Field on the, uh, the 19th. They have refitted, and now they are on this line in a defensive position. They actually are on this kind of flat little knoll here that juts out just a little bit to the east. The right-hand portion of the battery can fire due, um, due east, but notice the angle of the guns on the left of the battery. They're angled off to the, uh, to the northeast. Uh, now we're going to move further. I'm going the other way. Oh, okay. <laughs> you say. Off in this direction, right up the trail. You were looking right up the crest of the other low rise. But as you do, now look to your left front. Notice where the monuments are. They're on the back slope, uh, the reverse slope of this low rise of ground. Why is that? This is the place where the Union line began to be bent or folded back, refused uh, mm. back, since they can't continue it indefinitely to the mm. north. They have to bend it back someplace. They choose to do it here. Why? Because at the time of the Civil War, there was a large open ground here. It was a unique ecological community called a cedar glade. It's still here. But because the forest is um, today um, invaded with um, uh, exotic um, species like Chinese privet, um, because of an absence of fire, um, the cedar glade is being choked almost to death. The cedar glade is a result of the underlying limestone. And it occurs in places where that underlying limestone is close enough to the surface that as it deteriorates, it creates a very basic soil condition. That deteriorating lime um, creates a very basic soil condition. And some plants will not grow there. Some plants like that environment. In particular, cedars. Um, and uh, this was a very large cedar glade. It was a mile long, beginning here and stretching north along the crest of the low rise, draped over the crest of this low rise, 50 or 75 yards on either side of the crest. Today, if you walk up along this trail to the north, um, this cedar glade stretched all the way up to Reed's Bridge Road and just beyond. And as you walk along that trail today, you can see the little knots of it as it has cho been choked down. Today, I kind of describe it like a, um, a, a necklace with a few uh, beads or pearls um, along it. Uh, the, uh, instead of being one big continuous area. Uh, now, you get a little sense of it, it was kind of a grassy field. If you look right back there, just in the edge of the woods. Um, the big reason that you have some grass just growing inside the edge of the woods and under those cedar trees is the nature of this, um, this cedar glade ecology. The underlying limestone um, propagating certain types of plants and not others. Um, uh, many of the soldiers 
will describe the cedar glades on the battlefield, and there were many of them. Today, all of them have been squeezed down to almost nothing. Uh, they describe them as old fields. They look like an area that a farmer had once cleared um, and brought under cultivation, but had then abandoned. And in fact, if some of those soldiers had gotten out in them and kicked around in them, they would have said, well, I know why the farmer abandoned this. It's full of rocks. You can't farm this. Well, it was never actually farmed. But to somebody not familiar with cedar glade, glade ecology, it would have looked like an old field. Well, try to imagine an old grown-up field with some cedar trees around it and scattered through it, stretching northward and being able to see um, almost a mile to the north. Why did they bend the line back here at the south end of the Cedar Glade? What does that mile-long open area, 50, 100 to 150 yards wide, provide? Yes, fields of fire, but even more important than fields of fire is fields of observation because you want to be able to see the enemy. What end of the Union line is most important? The left. If the enemy is going to attack, they're going to, they're in this area, they're going to almost certainly have to cross that cedar glade, that open area. Um, and they could be observed, early warning could be obtained, and then, should they attack, they, you then have a, a better field of fire at a greater range. And what did they put right at the south end of the Cedar Glade? Guns of the 4th Indiana Battery. And those guns, echelon just a little bit further to the left, could fire right up this um, open ground to the, um, uh, to the north. The, um, um, uh, so the line now bends back here. The reason the uh, line of mine is that for the 38th Indiana, the 94th Ohio, 33rd Ohio, 2nd Ohio, the reason they make this kind of arc right here is the men are right at the edge of the woods, where the woods begin again at the edge of the cedar glade. What does the woods provide those soldiers? Cover and concealment. Um, and you then have the open ground in the front. Now, yes, these soldiers along this line are in a reverse slope defense. They are behind the crest. They have limited fields of fire. But if the enemy is going to attack here, what does the enemy got to do? Come from the east, out of the woods, into the open ground, climb the eastern slope, and then they're going to be silhouetted against that crest, brought under fire from the front, and what's going to come into the flank of those attacking um, enemy soldiers? Enemy. The artillery fire from, to, from the south of them. So this might not be the most ideal position, but does it provide the Federals some advantage here? Was it the brigade commander's judgment, or did Baird tell him? Um, it, um, it, well, that's not entirely clear. Um, someone did. That clears the... <laughs> Here's the 198 guys now. So. The monument to the 33rd Ohio. Notice that 30 years later, the veterans record this on their monument. Their line right at the edge of the woods, the open ground, the reverse slope rising in their front. The woods on the other side, the Confederates having attacked out of the woods, up that slope to the crest. Now, they are under fire from the, the uh, men of the 33rd, right here at the edge of um, the, um, uh, the woods. And notice amongst the soldiers, what do you see? see? Limbs, logs, branches, rocks, sticks, stones, stumps. Some of the crew feel fortifications. Ohio, um, 10th Wisconsin have taken advantage of the edge of the woods at the edge of the open cedar glade for cover and concealment where to build their field fortifications. Um, the line cannot just continue indefinitely along the edge of the woods. They don't have the troops for that. At some point, they have to bend or fold it back. And just here on the left of Scribner's Brigade, um, that bend will occur. And position right here at the point where the line really angles back and runs down the western slope of this low rise um, was placed King John King's Brigade of Regulars, the 15th, 16th, 18th, and 19th United States Infantry. 
that Brigade had been shocked in the fighting on the other 19th. Um, in the area to the northeast of the Winfrey Field, the 16th U.S. Infantry in particular had suffered extremely heavy casualties um, and is now just a fragment attached to one of the other regiments in the other brigade. Because King is at such a critical place, when he forms his line, he forms it three lines deep. Um, each regiment in a line, uh, the 15th, 19th, and 18th United States Infantry, one line behind um, the other. For a time, the 18th U.S. Infantry actually advances across the Cedar Glade uh, to the crest or even just a little um, uh, beyond. But the main regular brigade position is right here at this bend or angle in the line. Now they had started out the day further to the north in the Cedar Glade up at Reed's Bridge Road, but they had been drawn southward as the divisions took their position, primarily because there was so much space between where Scribner and Starkweather of their division were located and um, where the regulars were. Uh, but this also begins to illustrate one of Thomas's concerns, and that is how to protect and cover the left end of the line. Because as the line folds back right here and ends in the woods there just a short distance, the, um, the, end, the line um, is where? It is to the south of McFarland Gap, Gap Road. It is not touching the Lafayette Road, those two critical avenues of movement for the Union Army. And Thomas begins to realize that ideally this line should stretch further um, to the north, or at least cover more of that ground to the north. Um, and he will begin to take steps to do that. As we head back to the edge of the visitor center, we will um, begin um, ourselves to look at what Thomas is thinking and doing or having done to try to better protect the left flank. But, as we're going to find out, not all of that is completed before the Confederates finally attack. And so basically now, we are along the Union line as it's going to be when the Confederates finally do attack on September the 20th. Um, the, uh, the, uh, we talked just briefly yesterday, uh, three of the regiments of the regular brigade still have units on active duty today. Um, the 18th um, U.S. Infantry is in the 1st Infantry Division. The 15th U.S. Infantry has two battalions in the 3rd Infantry Division at Fort Benning and Fort Stewart. One deployed in Afghanistan um, right now. Um, and then the 19th U.S. Infantry um, trains uh, brand new infantry soldiers for our Army um, at Fort Benning. There is a modern 16th U.S. Infantry, but that today's 16th U.S. Infantry traces its lineage to the Civil War 11th Infantry, not the Civil War 16th Infantry. Um, Army lineage um, is, uh, well, there are no straight lines, um, and it is um, extremely incestuous sometimes. So. It depends on who's in charge and which units he served in, That's who right. gets taken. Yep. You know, in, in the if you've got, you got enough grade and political clout, you can make the lineage of your unit almost anything you want. <laughs> There's a whole office in Washington called Lineage and Honors. Um, and uh, so it's... Uh, it, it, quite a challenge to keep up on them on some of those things. But, um, the, um, in fact, the, the guys going over there are um, uh, officers in the 198th Infantry Brigade at the Infantry Training Center at Fort Benning. Um, they include um, a couple of officers from the 2nd of the 19th U.S. Infantry. Uh, there were some more 19th guys here uh, yesterday, but they have a um, graduation today at uh, Fort Benning, um, so they had to, uh, to go back. Um, but uh, And today, in addition to being the 150th anniversary of the Battle of Chickamauga, is also 19th U.S. Infantry Day, Rock of Chickamauga Day, because that regiment, adopting as a result of their stand on this ground um, after Chickamauga, as their motto, the Rock of Chickamauga.
ain't my bed. level of road and path creation is the Army use of the battlefield for training in Spanish American War, World War I and World War II. And in fact, many of the trails here are remnants of old Army roads um, that just served an Army function of some sort. So they don't follow any historic alignment. They don't even go in a historic direction. Um, and then in the 1960s and 70s, the Boy Scouts were, um, were turned loose with axes and paintbrushes. Um, and they um, added a whole system of trails here today. So the, the trail system that you see on the battlefield today really has nothing to do with the historic circulation pattern. But we know from some very detailed maps made by the veterans when they come back to create the battlefield park, one even surveyed in the spring of 1864, we know uh, much about the system of farm lanes uh, that connected all of these farmsteads in 1863. And what I've advocated for years is that we geo-reference those survey grade maps, because they are survey grade maps, um, and we begin um, erasing the Boy Scout Army um, road system or trail system and superimposing the historic circulation system on the battlefield so that you can go across the battlefield more like somebody would have been able to at the time. So. Um, now initially the Union line as it developed ended there at the left of um, King's Brigade just down the slope but it didn't even um, come down um, too far. Look at the distance between there and the Lafayette Road. They're not even close to that vital Lafayette Road corridor. And Thomas is concerned about that. Even before dark, or excuse me, before dawn, he is out riding around looking at the developing line. And he grows concerned that regardless of whether he could continue the line further to the north, he doesn't even touch the vital Lafayette Road. He will send a message to William Stark Rosecrans asking Rosecrans to come up and join him on this end of the line to look at how they might better protect that line. It is not clear that Thomas's message found Rosecrans that morning, but regardless, William Stark Rosecrans, just before dawn, swung into the saddle of his horse, seen by one soldier, um, and said to look very haggard and worn, but he swings into the saddle, and with James Garfield as chief of staff, and a number of other staff officers, Rosecrans starts riding north along the new, generally developing Union line from south to north, meeting with um, Sheridan, Davis, McCook, and others as he comes north, making adjustments along the line. And then he rides up into Thomas's sector and will encounter um, Thomas up at the McDonald Farm, where the visitor center is located today. And Rosecrans and Thomas will start talking about how better to protect the left of the Union line. This discussion, which I'll illustrate elements of as we work our way back, um, will result in the movement of more troops up here onto the left. One of the first and easiest things that could be done was to simply move Dodge's brigade which was the uh, four or, uh, fifth and sixth lines in Johnson's um, three brigade deep column, move Dodge's brigade up over here to the left. And George Dodge's brigade, um, shattered by the experience against um, Preston Smith's division the evening before, is moved over. And you see the monuments right here. They are deployed on the left of the regular brigade, and they are deployed facing essentially due north. But still, Dodge's small brigade does not extend to where? To the Lafayette Road. Um, and Thomas still has concern. Um, and so the, um, but we'll move on and we'll pick up the next part of the story out there.
Thank <laughs> you.